yeah, it was a big deal that this bad thing happened, but at the same time, that there's absolutely nothing else I, I could do at that point to change what had happened. My name is Joseph Almond. I was a full-time firefighter for the town of Skowhegan, running calls, you know, doing the <laughs> traditional firefighting stuff, and also ran a uh, small carpentry business. Being a firefighter, I felt more in tune with the community and more of a part of the community, being able to give back, you know, helping people in their worst situations. So it was any moment you're going on something to help somebody from the stuff that everybody sees of structure fires and things like that to helping somebody find their cat that got stuck in some duct work or something you know this all range of things that day began i was getting off work from the fire department ending my shift i had gotten ready and headed up north to a project that i was working on for my carpentry business did some things up there and then I got a phone call from some friends of mine that are through Main Street saying that they had a little issue with a guy that was filming a promotional video with his drone in our gorge down by the river in Skowhegan and said that he got it stuck and they're wondering if I could come and give a hand and check it out and see what I can do. So I kind of told him that yeah, I didn't finish up what I'm doing and then head into town. Skowhegan has a river that runs right down it and a gorge is probably about 30 to 35 feet with cliffs on either side with a river down bottom with some rapids that go down the middle of it. So it's fairly treacherous, you know, it's not, you know, it's not definitely an easy place to maneuver around and walk sometimes. So I showed up and talked to this guy and he was like, yeah, I got my drone stuck and he's like, I'll show you roughly where it's at. So I went out and started looking and listening and thinking, okay, what kind of equipment am I going to need to rappel down to kind of figure out what to do? And I had turned and after that, I remember nothing. Where I had fallen is basically where this brick building is down here, which is the town office. It's just a sheer cliff. There are some pretty good drops right where I was standing. And I'm, I'm just assuming, looking at the terrain, that where I stepped, something gave way, and I just went over. Down I went, right over the bank. And obviously you can see where it just kind of drops right off really quickly there. I had fallen down 25 feet, broke both my wrist, ribs, punctured a lung, broke a bone in my face, hit that rock and then kind of tumbled down a little bit more and ended up landing um, on another projected rock that had this piece of rebar that was sticking up and they said it was right in between my legs. They're like, how lucky it was that I didn't end up landing on that and getting hurt too. Luckily I didn't go into the river, which would have been probably fatal at that point. The guy that lost the drone and one of the police officers that were standing up there were like, where did he go? Like, they didn't even see what happened. I remember being in the chief's office when the phone call came from the PD, Detective Kelly Hooper, called the chief and said, I don't know where Joe is. And I remember hearing chief say, our Joe? Yeah. Your Joe, he was just here and now I can't hear him, I can't find him. I think he's fallen over the embankment. Hey, we think Joe fell over the cliff, like we don't know what happened. The chief made a real good call. Um, he remembered Joe having that watch. He dialed that, we think that's what woke him up. I started talking to him and he was like, hey, are you okay, what happened? And I was like, oh, I don't know, I think I got a bloody nose. I can remember talking to myself first thing was saying a prayer that Joe was going to be okay and that I'd make good decisions in helping him to get out. Rick had rappelled down and kind of came down to evaluate. My concerns was that he might be paralyzed but worse yet bleeding out. He said that all I was saying when I was down there is give me some drugs <laughs> and he was like I'm gonna help you Joe it'll be all right we're gonna get you out of here. I saw the blood coming out of his ears and I'm, you know, and I just, Joe, and I, can you move your legs? Yes, I can. I can't breathe though, I can't breathe. It's so it hurts to breathe. 
said, I know it does, I know it does. He was doing whatever he could to try to make me comfortable, but he had to clear the area to get the, you know, to get all the equipment down there to help me get out. We put him on the splint and uh, got him into that, packaged him, got him in there. And at that point, I know he was starting to go into shock and kept talking to him, kept talking to him. They set up another rigging at the top to lower some ropes down with two other firefighters that came down so that they could get me all tightened up. And then they basically manpower took and used ropes and pulleys and pulled me up over the bank and the three guys all at the same time to the top. The harnesses, all the rope bags, ropes, pulleys, all of that good stuff that helped them rappel down grab me off the cliff and come back up. You think about how you're gonna help other people with it and then, you know, when it's actually used to help you, it's, it's, uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit different, you know? Um, and makes you appreciate the fact that how well trained all these guys are. We got him up, got him in the ambulance, felt like forever to me. It's pretty emotional being one of your own. I was sedated, loaded in life flight over at the hospital, and then they flew me down to Maine Med in Portland. I woke up two days later in the hospital. Friends and family had come down. They had all let them into the room because from my understanding, they weren't necessarily sure if I was gonna make it. Pretty, pretty bad. I guess I really didn't realize exactly what happened until somebody told me. Yeah, I didn't know I fell, I didn't know any of that. I couldn't believe I fell, I got hurt. Like, I don't necessarily feel like I think of myself invincible, but I feel like I've always been fairly decent having good balance and being able to react to certain things and just having something this major happen was just kind of like very surreal and like just couldn't really believe that this had happened. You could see that my face was somewhat sunken in early on and actually even after surgery I had paralysis on the whole left side of my face so I could not blink my eye and move my lips. All the nerves were damaged there and I had blood in my ear canal and actually some of those things kind of linger on which most people don't notice but obviously me being me is like I can tell like that kind of thing. Really, I was in the hospital for 12 days, which is remarkable for the amount of injuries that I had. A lot of other people have been in there a lot longer with a lot fewer injuries, and I kind of lead that to having a positive attitude, you know. I was lucky in a way that I still could walk. You know, I didn't injure my spine, I didn't injure my legs, so that allowed me mobility, which helped me heal a little better. Um, and then having friends and family that came and visited the whole time and helped. When we were in the hospital, the neurologist was mainly the one, he said, with the trauma to your head and what had happened to your nasal airway. Some of those things wouldn't allow me to wear an air pack, which is kind of required for firefighting. And the possibility of getting hit in the head again in that type of environment that is brought to by firefighting could potentially be really life-threatening or, you know, really damaging. They actually made the decision that I wasn't gonna go back to being a firefighter anymore. That I had to kind of find a new profession. Right from the get-go, he was positive about getting better. Instead of pity patter about it and feeling bad for himself, he said, no, I'll do something else. I just said, you know what, I'm just gonna deal with what I got, work through it, and keep going. You know, it was a bad thing that happened, but what am I gonna do about that? It's over with, all I just gotta do is move forward. I had come here into this building and met with the owner, and he was asking me some construction questions. We talked about what he could do with the building, how he could make the space work, and codes, and all that kind of stuff. And he jokingly said, what would you think about opening up a coffee shop? We joked around about it, and. You know, it was one of those like serious, not serious kind of joking points because at that point I'd still have thought I was going to go back to being a firefighter. And oddly enough, 
the very next day uh, after that, I had called and talked to the neurologist and he was kind of like, uh, yeah, you're not going to be able to go back. So I sat there and talking to my wife and I was like, well shoot, I have this idea of a coffee shop. Like, why don't we just try that? I started talking about with friends and family, um, figuring out how to make this happen. Hey, how's it going? This is Joe, giving you an update. I used a GoFundMe page to kind of get kickstarted with some cash. I had some very good angel investors that gave me some money. I want to thank everybody that's donated so far. We raised $1,475 which allowed us to purchase an oven. Those kind of things all coming together and just working just kind of helped propel this forward. One step closer to getting this cafe going and off the ground. He's kind of had a dream. He loved to cook. He cooked at the firehouse, you know, always cooking something and sharing it with us all. I had a vision of what I wanted this place to look like and I could see it myself in my head, like the colors and the way all the woodwork and all that stuff was gonna be. I kind of put in all the skills that I had had over the years and the knowledge that I had to build out what we have now. You know, he wanted that little extra touch, make it just a little extra special, which Joe is, fits him perfectly. Like, let's offer something really nice. People feel comfortable to hang out and drink their coffee. It was tough in the beginning because I was still recovering, you know. I mean, it was quite a few months before I could actually use my wrist again because of the breaks. But I had friends that came in and helped clean and demo. And then I had some friends that actually came in and did a lot of the physical labor of building and putting the walls together and stuff like that. And then as I recovered, I was able to put in more and kind of move things forward. Some days seem like we're never gonna make it, like we're never gonna get there, but you just gotta keep pushing and having that positive attitude. Lots and lots of late nights, uh, trying to get everything lined up and ready to go. So we ended up opening at the, the last day in July, on July 31st. It is just what the people need here. A place to come and sit and talk and to mingle, socialize. It's got that positive, you know, come together, community feeling to it. I've always been that type of people person anyway. I love interacting with people, love talking with people, and to be able to have that now on a daily basis and be actually interacting with the public, it feels great, you know, being able to think about new ideas of different coffees and food ideas and collaborating with local businesses around is such a great feeling, you know, to be able to move this business forward. <laughs> but Joe is a great example of just being grateful and thankful for the little things and looking for the positive out of it and moving forward and trying to make something better of it. And he doesn't realize it, but so many other people, I think, benefited from his positive attitude. Don't feel like, you know, just because something bad happens to you that you have to kind of give up. There's always some avenue that you can go down to change your life for the better. I would pick your vision, stick with it, let your friends, your family help you out. Just don't give up. There's always something out there. Things can always get better. And on the other side of it, as friends and family or see somebody that's having a hard time, help them out, you know, give them a hand because we can all make each other better. We're Joe's Flatiron Cafe. We're open Monday through Saturday from 6 to 6. We're in downtown Skowhegan at 65 Water Street. You can't miss us. Everybody's welcome here.